So welcome to our event organizer COVID-19 update. Uh, this is the third webinar in the event organizer series so far during this pandemic. And we will continue to have these webinars as the situation changes, um, as we learn new information, um, and as events, more events come online. My name is Tara McCarthy. I'm the Director of National Events here at USA Cycling. We have a number of topics that we'll be going through today. We'll hear from Chuck Hodge uh, with the USA Cycling Update. We will hear from our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Michael Rashan, about what's going on medically. We'll introduce our event organizer forum. We will hear from Bike Reg. Uh, Ross Kraus is with us, the CEO of Bike Reg. He's gonna be talking about what's going on in events across the country. So for instance, what types of events are coming online, where those are taking place, what the registrants look like, et cetera. We'll also hear about how to run registration and packet picket, excuse me, packet pickup safely during these times. Um, and then we're gonna talk to a Southeast race director who's recently run a cross country mountain bike race within regulation. And then we will hear about the results process, including a protest process. And then we'll hear about some rules within our rule book that we're talking about internally modifying given the state of, of uh, the, the pandemic. We'll then have times for, time for your questions, about 30 minutes or so, and you'll be able to ask questions to any of our presenters. Now, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, again, we do ask that you all mute your phones or your computers. This allows the webinar to have less feedback and allows all the participants to hear everything clearly. Um, number two, please send your questions to either this National Event Services account or Chuck Hodge. Uh, we are the hosts of the webinar, so we'll be able to take those questions and direct them to the specific presenter uh, to answer. Now, we will go ahead and get started here. So Chuck Hodge, Chief of Racing uh, and Events for USA Cycling. Chuck, just let me know uh, when to advance slides if. I don't know, I think we're good with that one, Tara, and thanks uh, for getting this set up. And good morning, everybody. We just wanted to give a really brief update <clears throat> on some items that we have going in regards to permits. Later, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, some modifications to regulations and, and other items. I think most people know, and if you don't, you're learning now that we did begin repermitting events in June 1. We'd had a prohibition on new event permits for uh, a couple months as we learned, all learned more about the pandemic and what was going on. Uh, along with our COVID-19 resource tools, we began to open permitting back up on June 1. Uh, a couple things with that. Uh, first, and this has always been the case uh, with our event permits, but it's even more important now in this era, is organizers do need to have all local permits, permissions, and be following all regulations. And traditionally that's been things like road closures or trail access or getting permission from the park for your cyclocross event or from a landowner for an aid station and a Grand Fondo. That's always been required for your permit, your insurance to be in effect. What's been added on to that now in, in just about everywhere in the US is an organization or group that's not normally been involved in permitting, which is your local health department. So we're making sure that or working with our organizers to make sure you are touching base with that health department. Uh, just a reminder that even if you have an event on private property, uh, that you still need to follow those regulations on social distancing or group numbers, uh, mask usage, whatever the mandate is and the regulation is from your uh, health department, you still need to be following those. And we're working with a lot of events to, to make sure that's happening. Uh, another item is uh, we know that costs are going up for organizers, things like buying PPE, are adding your expense. Uh, also, most events either don't have the ability to have as many people or possibly aren't seeing as many people at their events, uh, which is impacting the revenue line. Uh, to assist organizers, we have eliminated permit fees for this year. Uh, we did send this communication out. That is from June 1 to December 31st for events impacted by COVID. 
from June 1 to December 31st, we've waived that initial permit fee. If you have paid, if you permitted your event earlier in the year for that June 1 through December 31st, we will refund that to you. So it's not lost money. And uh, I'll talk about how to do that here in a bit. Also, we've lowered the insurance surcharge down to 350. Uh, it was a, a scale above that from 375 to 475, depending on event type. And we lowered that to 350. Uh, again, this is really us understanding, I think, the cost that events are facing as well as the, the revenue impact and, and trying to support those events that are safely and legally able to happen over the next few months. A couple final things. We do have some of our staff uh, under furlough again. Uh, the timeline of that, those staff coming back varies based on the position. Uh, we are covering their health insurance while they're gone and uh, we're hoping to have them back as the, the sport picks up again. Uh, if you have any specific questions on events, we do have a general event services at usacycling.org email that we monitor constantly. Uh, so if you have, say, that uh, refund for an event that you may have uh, entered in March for an August event that you're still able to produce uh, and need that refund, you can send that question into that. Uh, Stuart Lamp and Valicia Frazier, Valicia will be presenting, I think, later, uh, are still uh, working and will remain the main point of contact for uh, event services. But uh, feel free to use that, uh, that general event services at usacycling.org email. Tara, that's it, and I'll, uh, I'll be on if anyone has any questions and I'll be helping manage those. Thanks. Great, thanks, Chuck. And so next up, we have Diker, excuse me, Dr. Michael Rashan. Sorry, it's already a morning. He's our chief medical officer here at USA Cycling, um, and he's been providing updates as we've gone along with the pandemic. So he'll give us an update here. Thanks. Thanks so much, and thanks everyone for joining. I don't have a lot of uh, you know um, you know massive increase in knowledge to share. I, I will say that uh, we have. We've learned a ton about how to treat this virus and how to um, how to get very symptomatic people through the hospital. Uh, we've we've had uh, significant improvement in overall mortality from the from the early days, and and there's been a, a couple of other sort of new classes of drugs that have been that have been proven to be effective for those very severe cases. Um, one of those I'm sure you've heard about is remdesivir, which is a, a drug that helps slow down viral replication and in very severe cases seems to uh, decrease their length of illness. Um, but the really exciting stuff is with a few different drugs that control the immune response to the virus. So again, if you think about it, um, there's, you know, there's only a couple of ways to get out of this pandemic. One is with either herd immunity, which we're a long way away from, or an effective vaccine, which unfortunately we're also it seems like a long way away from. And the other uh, way is with, um, is with effective treatments. Um, if you can imagine sort of a penicillin-like pill for the coronavirus uh, where we could reduce mortality by a lot, then uh, we think we could open up sort of the economy and, and things faster. So we are getting closer to that. We're certainly a long way off, but if you look at the overall mortality from the early days to where we are now, it has, there's been a significant improvement. As expected, we have seen a lot of, uh, you know, places that are seeing uh, an increase in cases as, as things open up and people are going back to work. Some of those, uh, you know, there's some concern about, is that really truly a, an increase in, in the spread compared to what it was before, or is it just that we're able to test more? Um, the testing capacity early on was very, very limited. Um, and we were, we were essentially restricted to only testing people that were getting admitted to the hospital in many places. Now that testing capacity has increased a lot and we've seen a lot more uh, testing. And with that, of course, you're gonna find more cases. So some of the increase in cases is really minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic people who don't you know, require hospitalization. But uh, if we know that they have the virus, then we can help quarantine them and prevent the spread to other people. So there are some places that are seeing an increase in cases almost purely due to an increase in testing. Um, but then there are also other places that have seen new outbreaks um, 
where where there is we know community spread. I will say this that the uh, the um, we've learned a couple of things about this. Number one, it's very very local. So that. It was the same way in the beginning, right? The, you know, big outbreaks in Seattle and New York and other places were very quiet. We've seen that exact same thing happen uh, as the cases have begun to reemerge. So it's it's very local and it can happen quite quickly. Even just over a couple of weeks, you can see an increase in cases. Uh, for instance, here in Colorado, we have seen uh, continuing uh, declining cases. We're seeing about 10 new cases a day over the last three days four days, which is, that's over the whole state. So that's pretty amazing. Meanwhile, in other states like Florida or Arizona or Texas, they're seeing up to 4,000 new cases a day. So it's moving quickly and, and those trends can reverse uh, very quickly. So, uh, that makes it difficult if you're trying to set up an event since you're trying to predict what's happening, you know, months down the road and it can be difficult. Um, I don't have any answers for you on that. Just wanted you to, to be aware. Uh, again, like, like Chuck said, I think the key thing is to work with the public health department early and to sort of uh, have your plan in place, even if when you're planning the event, there's minimal uh, cases in that location. By two months or three months later, it could have changed. So you have to have all of the planning in place so you can convince the, uh, the public health folks that you are, have done everything you can to prevent it. Um, one other uh, new learning that I'll, that I'll talk about, one of the things we worry about with uh, any event is the risks associated with traveling. And we have had a couple of papers come out that have described, um, you know, basically the safety of, of air travel. It's interesting, the risk of transmitting the virus on an airplane is really much lower than I would have thought. Um, and, and these are from a couple of actual cases, uh, two papers published where they had huge, you know, transatlantic flights um, with over 300 people on board and really very few people um, contracted the, the virus. In one case, there was about 3% of the people on the plane that, that got the virus um, and they were all very close to, to, a, to the original patient who was very, very symptomatic and, and in that, case that nobody, it was very early on, nobody was doing anything to mitigate the spread. So there, nobody was wearing masks, nobody was doing temperature checks or anything like that. So even in that case, a closed environment on an airplane with, uh, with minimal precautions, the, the spread was lower than I would have predicted. In another case, a symptomatic patient was on a, a you know, transatlantic flight um, and spread the virus to no one on the plane, despite not using masks or anything like that. So that may be some good news um, for, uh, you know, if you're planning an event that some people will travel to. Um, my takeaway from this is that some reasonable precautions, not letting symptomatic people on the plane, those people wearing masks, anyone who might have symptoms or might have an exposure, uh, and everyone else wearing masks and doing careful hand washing, uh, that combined with the, with the you know, uh, air filtering capacity on the plane may mean that air, sapel, air travel is safer than we, than we thought. So um, that's, uh, I suppose, the two, two pieces of good news. Number one, uh, we are learning uh, new drugs that are, that are helping control uh, the disease, and we're learning more about how it spread. It uh, clearly seems to me that uh, indoor crowded gatherings are the highest risk events. The, the risk of outdoor spread is, is quite low. I think we've seen some of that with the protests that have happened across the country. We really haven't seen much in the way of spread uh, that has been tied back to those, and that was people in relatively crowded settings, but at least it was outdoors. Uh, so that's good for us in the cycling world. Um, again, Recommendations are the same, which is make sure you talk to your uh, to the local health folks uh, and that you've done, gone through the risk mitigation tool and done everything that you can because you can't predict exactly what's going to be happening, you know, a month down the road. Um, number two, pay close attention to all of the off bike stuff so that uh, any any uh, crowded gatherings indoors are minimized because um, we think that's probably the highest risk of spread. That's all I have for you, but I'll, I'll definitely be here to answer questions at the end. 
Great, thanks, Dr. Rashan. So just to let you guys know, we did create an event organizer forum. This is the, the address and I will email out this URL post webinar. So this is, this is a pretty simple forum, but we wanted to give you all the opportunity to talk to each other across the country. We know that a lot of you locally are able to, to talk to each other, uh, network, share best practices, but we did want to expand this across the country. That way someone from New York could talk to somebody in Texas about what they're doing. So please check this out. Use this as best as you can. We have a couple of different sections and since this is brand new, we will work on modifying this to make sure that it works the best for everybody. So we have general event operations. This is where you all can discuss registration, your podium process, et cetera. And then we have a discipline specific operation. So you can see we have a road section, BMX, rec rides, gravel. Um, there's also a section for USA Cycling to post announcements. So for instance, what Chuck gave you um, in terms of what we're doing with the insurance fees, that's information that we'll post here. That way the users can see that as in another communication channel. So check this out. Um, definitely start populating it. We're going to end up pulling the golden nuggets that you guys post on here and we'll actually add those to the event organizer return to racing and riding on our covid resource page so just let us know uh, how you like this let us know if there's any issues or how we can adjust it that way it can be best utilized for everyone and chuck did just email out that excuse me chat that url out for everybody all right, so next up we have Rob Ross Krause. He is with Bike Reg. He's the CEO of Bike Reg. And as, and as, as I mentioned, he is going to just be talking about uh, what's going on in the event world um, with some data and what they're seeing from Bike Reg. Great, all right. Thanks Tara for organizing and getting everyone together for this. This is super helpful. Um, I would say the forum, I'm really excited about that. Something I was gonna touch on as one of the key takeaways we've heard is just communicate with each other see what's been working for those um, events that have started back up. I know there's not many to look at just yet, but people are getting creative out there. Um, just quick background on the data that we've looked at so people can understand where that's coming from and hopefully it's useful to you. Definitely um, throw some questions uh, at us later if you have any. Um, we're looking at uh, specifically a bike, but we've also been monitoring um, our run platform as well to see what solutions are coming up there from running race directors and that's been interesting to see some takeaways that I'll get to. Um, we've been reaching out to our, our event directors um, pre-event and post-event for those that are putting on live events over the weekends. Um, then we're looking at data. Specifically, the data I'm going to talk about today is looking at um, June, July, and August separately this year compared to last year to see what are the trends we're seeing in event types that are working, um, what's the demographics in that, and see if there's anything useful that you can work with uh, that might help you in your event. Um, as far as the types of events there, we're looking across the board at all different cycling disciplines and probably about 20% of the data that we're looking at here is from USA Cycling sanctioned events and the other 80% is unsanctioned, but we wanted to, we split that out at first and realized it was most useful to look at it as a whole, just so you can see how, how is cycling working right now. Um, I guess one other caveat here is it is changing very quickly. Like Dr. Roshan said, it's hard to plan ahead to know exactly what you're gonna look at when you know things change quickly in a week or two. And we've seen positive change in that. Uh, every week, the news seems to be getting a little bit better as far as what we're seeing for um, uptake, what we're seeing for registrations and feedback we're getting from event directors. So that's all good stuff. Um, let me just start, I'll touch on event types here. That's the first topic. Um, maybe no surprise here, but one of the things that we've seen the lowest numbers in that hasn't bounced back well yet is traditional road racing. And from our conversations with a handful of directors, I think, the pack, um, pack starts and pack racing is a limiter, um, both from like perception of the athletes and just uh, safety concerns. Um, I think we are seeing that pick back up. We're seeing some crits and some open track sessions and things of that nature picking up, so that's good news. The events that we've seen that have really bounced back the most are um, things like off-road and gravel and time trails, albeit there's a very small number of time trails we're looking at, so um, just a little asterisk on that. But I think with off-road and gravel, from what we've seen um, and what we've been able to gather from directors is they're able to get pretty creative in how their handling starts from say small waves of 10 or um, based on self-seeding and ability 
They're even using, some people have been using um, category field limits to have start waves that are by time rather than your just traditional categories. So you might end up with like a little bit of a busier process from the registration standpoint of what people are looking at, but you can have people register for a specific start time wave and limit it that way. That way you really only have people queued up in a group in a very small group for a short period of time and send them off. Um, and long distance mountain bike races and gravel events have been able to do that with some success already. Um, that might be an option with the road as well. I think people just need to think flexibly about what their event might look like this year. A big takeaway has been thinking differently that I think it's possible to put on an event this year, many events this year, but it might not be your event that you're used to putting on. It's gonna look a little different, but people are hungry to get out there from everything we've seen. Um, so that's, I think that's touching on the event type trends we've seen. Uh, as far as location, uh, we're seeing numbers really pick up in uh, Texas, Pennsylvania, Colorado. There's some interesting ones, even Massachusetts, we're here where we're, our office is. We're very early in what's being allowed right now, um, but we're seeing some different types of rides that are in small waves or even virtual events and things of that nature that are taking off that we really tried to focus on the in-person events in this data. Um, Utah is starting to pick up as well. Again, I think specifically in off-road, um, even some Grand Fondos that are starting up, I think experiential events where people are willing to start in smaller groups and spread out and don't feel like they all need to be in one group is kind of the key at this moment. Um, as far as travel, uh, typically when we looked back in 2019 in like our top 50 events in just June, uh, about 60, 65% of participants are from in the same state as the event. That's gotten to be a greater percentage right now. We're at um, 77, close to 80% here are coming from in-state. So I think that's telling you that your market is gonna be very local as far as what their comfort level is, who they feel they're gonna be around and be able to make a quick decision. In some cases, events haven't made the final call as to whether it's happening or not until a week or two out. So you're dealing with a much more local market and people that aren't willing to travel right now. Um, as far as um, demographics, I was hoping there'd be some magic takeaway here about who you should target your, um, target your marketing to and who's gonna show up, but it's very much in line with what we usually see, which is the same percentage split of male, female, um, within one year, the same average age, which is like 44. Um, and we're seeing usually in, in June right now, at least, and in these summer months, it's about 75% male, 25% female participation, and that's all within a percentage point or two from last year. So no change there. It's the same types of people, maybe just slightly smaller numbers. Um, as far as some um, event decisions and modifications, things that we've been able to gather from our data and from our surveying of directors, I think the biggest takeaway is just communicate, communicate, communicate with each other. Again, this forum, I'm psyched you guys are doing this. It's a great idea. Learn from what other people are doing and communicate with your athletes. Um, where we've seen some friction is where people aren't clearly communicating with their athletes about what's going to drive their decision about the event. Um, refunds, if it's going virtual, if it's happening, if it's being postponed, if people can communicate how and why they're making decisions, um, that's been really important. And we've seen people be open to a no refund policy or a partial refund or a deferment, um, deferral, as long as you're clear about why and um, give people a chance to maybe chime in if they have a special situation. Um, we have some tools that can help you with that. I won't turn this into a long spiel on that. Reach out to us if you wanna know more about these, but we've been having people use our custom question tool and allowing people to go in and um, edit their entry to indicate um, if they're gonna be attending or not, or if you're, re if you're, no, if you're canceling an event, what you wanna do about that. Um, we've been seeing people email their past participants to survey them about their interest in different formats of racing um, or riding. Um, that's been useful. And uh, as far as post-event, I know I'm a little bit over my time and try to wrap this up, but uh, from the handful of events we've seen that have been able to communicate the success of their events, they've been following these local protocols. They've been doing temperature checks. Um, they've been seeing a pretty small number of people that actually have decided not to come because of concerns. As long as they're communicating what the safety protocols are, that's made a huge difference in people's comfort level. They've had some, maybe a larger number of no-shows than usual, but they've still run what they consider a safe and successful event. Um, I do see there's some questions here, so I'll review those um, to jump back into in our question section and we can move on to the next section. So um, that's it. Definitely throw some more questions my way and I'll see what else I have for trends or data that might help people out.
Thank you. Great, thanks, Ross. Um, and if if someone didn't ask about the age demographic, maybe you, I'll, I'll ask that question again during yeah. our question and answer period. Okay. Great, thank you. All right, so next up, we're gonna talk about how to run registration and packet pickup as safe as possible during this time. And we're gonna use a lot of information that is in our event organizer guideline, which is on our COVID resource page. But we did just wanna talk you through this. As we start seeing events come back online, we know that registration and packet pickup is one of those off the bike areas um, that Dr. Rashawn was talking about. This is where you need to pay attention to. This is where people are going to form lines. This is where people are gonna congregate. So we're just gonna talk about that for a little bit and definitely be sure to refer back to our event organizer guideline on this. So as Ross said, you're gonna to wanna to communicate as much as possible to your participants. As event organizers, we know that a lot of athletes don't read things when we send them. Whether you send an email, whether you have something on your website, be sure that you are over communicating as much as possible, especially as we know we have regular customers that come back to our events year after year. These people typically know what the process is, they know where the registration tent is, but make sure if there's a change, you're communicating that to them. And again, over communicate that. It's gonna be super important during these times to keep everybody safe. So when setting this up for whether you're outside or inside, make sure you have signage up, make sure you're six feet apart, um, whether you have uh, electronic waivers only in your emails, you'll tell people that, whether it's paper, you know, just make sure that you're telling everybody what's going on and what the expectation is. As Dr. Rashan has said, social distancing is one of the most effective ways to help prevent the spread of this illness. Um, we know that six feet is that kind of made up number, but that distance is what's being recommended by most, most health departments as well as the CDC and the WHO. So make sure that in every single way where you do have people coming together, so registration, packet pickup, the start, the finish, the podium, you are creating a process and procedure where people can maintain social distancing. Now for sanitation, we know that Again, the CDC is recommending face coverings and masks. For your staff that you have working the event, whether it's a volunteer or a paid staff member, you could recommend or require that they do wear face coverings when they're gonna be interacting with your participants. Make sure that you have hand sanitizer everywhere. Make sure that your pens are being sanitized between people signing waivers or signing up for your race. Make sure that any high touch area or object like those pens are being cleaned thoroughly according to CDC cleaning guidelines. As you guys have seen a lot of different areas where there's an exchange of money, like at the grocery store, um, some people have been able to place plexiglass between the cashier and the customer. If you have the capability of doing this, this is just one more strategy to pre prevent those droplets from exchanging from person to person. I know that's a little bit, that might be hard for people. There's definitely other ways to mitigate this, but that is one option. Going back to that sanitation, make sure you do have someone monitoring any of those high touch areas regularly. So assign one person to take care of this area to make sure that it's being cleaned throughout the time registration or packet pickup is opened. Um, along with those, those, that idea, if you are going to have an in-person registration or packet pickup, have someone who's monitoring that area, almost like a greeter, let them, let them talk to the participants, make sure that they are spaced appropriately. Not everybody sees the lines on the ground. Again, not everybody reads signage. So having somebody watching over this area could be a great way to get to mitigate risk and registration or packet pickup. Now this one is always testy in, in the bike world, but something that I think a lot of people should consider during these times is going with pre-registration only and eliminating on-site registration. Now this doesn't eliminate packet pickup in all cases, 
but it would eliminate the exchange of money, signing of waivers, et cetera. If you can get your participants to a pre-registration only format, I think we'll be in a much better shape than if we do allow registration on site. Again, getting bike racers to actually do this is pretty slim, so this might not be a solution for everybody. Um, and as Ross said, be creative when you're, when you're looking at this. There's all different types of ways in which you can have on-site registration and packet pickup that allow you, your staff, your volunteers, and the participants to be safe. And overall, that goal should be to follow all local guidelines, provide that safe environment, and have fun. So I'm gonna just go to the next slide. So here's some signage that different events and the CDC is requiring. So on the left-hand side here, um, there's a couple of different signage that actually a, a county here in Colorado um, is requiring events and businesses to display. These are things that you can use as an example. Um, it talks about what the event or business is doing to protect their customers. Um, hopefully this type of signage would give your participants uh, a peace of mind that you are going through all of these checklists and you're doing the appropriate things to keep everybody safe. Again, a notice saying that the business has submitted mitigation plans and received approval uh, for the event. And here on the right, these are some CDC signs and you can actually go to the CDC website and download these and use, print them off however you want, post them on your website. Um, it's a great resource. They probably have, I think it's about four pages of signs. So definitely check this out. I'll include the link again in the post webinar email. But again, here, how to stop the spread of germs, talks about social distancing, cleaning, washing your hands, wearing a face covering, uh, great signage to have up and about on your venue. Again, these diagrams are from our event organizer return to riding and racing uh, guidelines. So these are some alternative ways that we've thought about to hold registration or packet pickup. And I'll just talk through these. The, the points are really the same across each of the different scenarios here, but we'll just go ahead and talk about them. So this is actually a drive-through registration or packet pickup system. Again, most of your traffic should be one way, just again, like grocery stores, one way aisles, make sure that there's one entrance and one exit. It, cross, it prevents people from crossing or being head to head. So, Participants would stay in the car, they would drive up, they would talk to a staff person outside the vehicle with a face covering. That staff person would go to the packet pickup tent, grab their stuff, and then hand off the packet to the athlete in the car. And then the car could go ahead and move to, to the parking area. We also have in this diagram a safety marshal. Again, this is kind of that greeter that's going to be able to direct people as to what's going on. This is a pretty unfamiliar format that you might be using. So having someone there to guide people through is going to help the process and prevent that log jam that we can sometimes see. Now for indoor registration and packet pickup, this is something that we utilize quite a lot at our national championships. Again, you can see this one-way travel. There's six feet markers on the ground for people to abide by. Um, there's hand sanitizer at the entrance and at the exit. That way the participants can hand sanitize before they approach the table, pick up anything, touch anything. And then once they're done receiving their materials, they can hand sanitize before exiting the area. So again, we're trying to eliminate high touch already by having the participant hand sanitize before they get there, but then the staff would wipe things through every so often to make sure that these areas are maintaining cleanliness. And this is very similar. This is an outdoor registration packet pickup diagram, very similar to the drive-through. This is just a walk-through. So again, just a slightly different setup if you're outdoors, Markings on the ground six feet apart. You have the hand sanitizer prior to touching any of the material. You have the hand sanitizer post receiving any material. And something to think about when you are doing packet pickup, think about whether you can mail your participants their race numbers. Um, 
that makes me nervous, honestly, as an event organizer, because some people are going to forget their numbers. But even if you're, you're able to get 80% of your participants who are going to bring their own number that you've mailed them, you're now preventing 80% of your participants from having to engage with a staff member in this location and only 20% would have to go for a troubleshoot. So think about whether that's an option for you. Um, also, you know, you can package up people's race number, give them their safety pins, their zip ties in a packet, hand that out to your participant and there's no exchange. You don't have to touch people's hands. You can literally just one corner of the packet, the participant hands grabs the other corner of the, the packet. There's also some ideas about a self-serve area. So you can go up, pick the next number in the bin, show the staff that number and they can assign it to you, the participant's name. So definitely think about those creative ways in which the high touch areas are completely eliminated or at least decreased for the large number of your participants. Also to reduce that contact, make sure that people are signing electronic waivers. USA Cycling allows electronic waivers, take advantage of that, then you eliminate that in completion. Um, if someone is registering on site, do not hand out receipts. Make sure that there's an opportunity for an electronic receipt. For series, use one number throughout your entire series, that way you're not having to continually give riders numbers every single week just give them one number for the whole series and you'll eliminate a lot of those those contacts if you have a goodie bag or swag that you normally hand out think about whether you can turn that into a virtual goodie bag there's a number of companies out there that provide that opportunity for you to do that provide discounts as a coupon electronically um, or vouchers to receive different products so consider that as an option as well and something that Ross probably might not mention, but we have been talking about the ability for events to create, um, it's not necessarily a wait list, but it's almost like a, a pre-registration wait list. So if you're concerned about whether your registrations are gonna meet your number to make sure that the event is financially viable, you can open up a pre-registration wait list to gauge interest in your event. And through Ross's system, there's no money exchanged here, so you don't have to worry about any refund issues, but it is a way for people to say, hey, I am committed to coming, I am going to sign up for the wait list. And then you have the ability when you decide that your event is gonna go forward, basically to capture all those payments and open up the event. So think about whether that's an option for, for your event and, and a piece of information that would help you as you as you plan your event. All right, we're gonna move on forward. So now I'm gonna turn it over to David Harlow. He is an event organizer in the Southeast. And as I mentioned, um, he recently held a cross country mountain bike race. And so we'll hear from him in regards to how he was able to accomplish that. David, are you, let's see. Can you hear me now? Yes, there you are, David. Thank you. Um, thanks, Tara. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, we had a mountain bike event, a cross country event, about three weeks ago, um, and uh, went pretty well. Um, and we we actually we took we went to you know great lengths to make sure that you know every everyone was safe. So um, I'll just kind of go through my list of what we did. But uh, one of the things we did before anyone was on site, of course, is we did highly recommend. Um, online pre-registration, but as Tara said, you know, that's like pulling teeth sometimes and uh, tough to do. But um, but we had probably about, uh, I'd say about 85% of our people that raced actually signed up online, but they still did have to have packet pickup. Um, so what I did starting the day is the way the park is laid out. Um, there's the starting area, which is up kind of in a parking lot, and then probably about 40 yards away is um, a big shelter. We use that as our registration shelter. Uh, what I did with that is basically I took, there's, you know, typically picnic tables under that. I took a lot of the picnic tables and just spread them out away where they were kind of unusable. Um, yeah, you really would have had to crawl into them, uh, crawl across them to use them. Um, and, and nobody did, by the way. Um, so I spread those out. I had, I did have a day of registration table where I had um, plenty of hand sanitizer available. We'd wipe down the pens before that, wipe down the table. It was actually one of my tables. 
it wasn't the, the uh, picnic table, it was just a folding table, a plastic one, and I'd wipe the surface down on that. So we, we, we scrubbed everything um, before the event happened. Um, and then what I did is probably about 12 feet from where my registration people were, we put the first cone, an orange cone, and I printed out um, a bunch of signs that said, notice we're practicing social distancing. And then from probably seven, eight feet between each cone, I would put a, a sign in there, and then I'd, I'd kind of walk those cones up the little walking path to where people would come down to the registration. And then my registration person just called them up one at a time so there wasn't a group of people um, that were uh, standing around, you know, waiting. Um, we do use series numbers, so that, like Tara said, that is something that, uh, you know, once you get your number, unless you lose it or it blows off your car on the way home, um, you know, that, that's their number for the season. So that does eliminate that that potential problem. Um, prior to the racing, though, again, I sent out email um, blasts to people, and I did put in there the, the standard um, statement of if you feel sick, have been sick, you know, traveled abroad, blah blah blah. Um, you know, please make sure you know you don't you're not sick if you've been tested or you have any symptoms. Please do not come to the race. And as you all know. We, People that are racing, if they feel sick, they're not going to race. You know, they're they're pretty much. I'm not going to go get last place just because I need to race. Hopefully, um, let's see. So, uh, the, so with the starting area, what I did is um, I created zones. I created a start zone, which I used with orange cones, and I had signs printed, and then I used uh, like chalk paint just so it would go away pretty quickly. Um, and I set up the start zone. I had uh, two people down monitoring the start zone, the stages, as, as we called the racers up. Um, so if your group, say beginner men, 19 to 39 was the first group, we called that group up. Um, you know, we were well within our numbers that we're supposed to have in a group together and stuff, so that was never a problem. But then we had stage one, stage two, and, then, and I had a stage three. We didn't end up, end up needing that. Um, but those were spread out. The, the, end, the end of stage one was at least 10 feet from the beginning of stage two and then so forth on stage three. And then my, my, uh, my spotters, so to speak, would uh, we'll call the people up to the next stage and then we'd start them off. And then, of course, they're racing, they're spread out. Um, let's see. Um, once they finish, you know, again, you, you rarely have people coming in big groups. I think we might have had two or three racing each other to the finish line. And then, of course, they went their separate ways to the parking lot to – to change into their attire and everything. Um, one thing I did too is sometimes with our races, we'll have two waves. We'll have like a 10 a.m. wave and then we'll have like a 1 p.m. wave. Um, the 10 a.m. wave may be our experts and our sport riders. And then the beginner, uh, the next wave might be our beginners and our juniors. So I split the day and all the races we're doing, we split the day into three waves where we had a 9 a.m. wave, we had an 11.30 a.m. wave, and then we had a 1.30 a.m. wave. So I, I, I added time to the, uh, to the start times of each wave, which basically, you might have had people driving into the park, overlapping each other to start get ready for their wave, but no one, there was no large gathering. There was never, you know, we never had more than, I think I never saw more than like 10 people together um, through the whole day, um, even when we did the podiums. But So I spread the start times out through the day. It made a longer day for me as a promoter, but that's a small price to pay just to make sure everybody's safe, of course. Um, so by the time the first wave, which was our experts, were done, we started the second wave. We did their awards very quickly. They were gone. Um, and then there was no there was no lingering. Um, you know, we didn't have a food truck or anything like that. We didn't do anything to keep people on site other than get your medal and go away, um, go home. Um, with the podiums, and I think Tara put a picture up. Um, we spread the podiums out. I know with a lot of races, people like to you know get close to each other, put their hand on the other person's back, and for the photo opportunity, I spread them out. So if they'd have done that, they'd have fallen off the podium. Um, hate to do that, but um, but we did spread them out. Um, what I did also is I we had uh, uh, trophies this time. So basically, when they got up there, my assistant he'd already put the trophy on the podium. We didn't shake any hands. We didn't you know do any fist bumps or anything like that. Um, we got them up. You know, here's first place, here's second place, third place. Thanks for racing, and they got out of there. Um, and again, in that area, we did it still in the staging area where we registered previously. Um, we had everything spread out so people couldn't sit down and get too comfortable. It's just basically stand in small groups, clap, and go. Um, and then afterwards, you know, with the social distancing signs, of course, at the beginning of the day, I'd spread signs out through the parking lot because, as most of you know as promoters, that's where you're going to get your gatherings is, you know, after an event where everybody's talking about it. But I monitored it. I had several people walking around all day monitoring. Um, no one had to say, hey, guys, can you break it up? Because, like, again, I think the most we had was maybe seven or eight people that were in a group, and those were, those were teammates that were just 
talking about the race afterwards. So we, it, it spread out pretty well. Um, again, the registration, the start, finish, and the staging areas were all at least, I'd say, 40 to 50 yards apart. So there was never a gathering. The way this course is laid out, um, even spectators kind of just pick spots along. As you know, mountain biking is a tough spectator sport. Um, but everybody seemed to follow their social distancing guidelines and spread out. There was never a big group of 40 people watching people come through the start finish. It was six, eight, 10, 12 feet apart. Um, and then through the day, too, um, I made announcements through the whole day saying, hey, folks, remember, we're practicing social distancing. Uh, please respect others um, and, and, you know, wash your hands. And, you know, I had a set statement. I did that through the whole day and everything. And then, um, of course, I made sure, too, the bathrooms, the park's been great to work with. Uh, made sure they had disinfected soap in all the bathrooms, and uh, that actually ran out one time. So I personally went and got more, and uh, made sure that you know they they always had disinfectant soap, which they should have anyway <laughs> for the bathroom. But um, and I always carry some too. I carry three or four jars of disinfectant hand wash and disinfectant soap with me now. So anywhere we go, if they don't have it, I've got it. Um, and I also carry toilet paper too, just in case. So. Um, so that was it. I mean, we kept them spread out. Everyone seemed to listen. Everyone was really excited to race, but I think they knew we had to be a little different and we had to we had to take precautions and we had to respect each other's space, personal space. And, you know, I, I didn't see everybody every minute of the day, but just from the people that were helping me and then what I saw, everyone seemed to really, they were thankful to be there and they were going to do what they needed to do to make sure that we, we had this happen and it was safe and it was successful. So I, I thought it was a good a good thing. Great, thanks, David, and appreciate you sharing what what you did enable, what you did to enable you to hold the race. And it's good to hear that people were excited about it and appreciated your efforts. I think that's what Ross was saying that people are excited to get back to racing. Yes, they they really really are. All right. So next up, we will Chuck will talk about rules modification and uh, the electronic results procedure and, and protest process during this time. Great, thanks, Tara. And uh, we're getting toward the end, so if, if you do have questions that we haven't been answered, we've been answering quite a few in the chat functionality, including some private uh, messages. Feel free to send those to either Tara at the national events chat or uh, to everyone, and we'll get to those uh, right after my portion here. I'm going to talk about a couple things uh, revolving around sort of modifications. The theme uh, through this, I think you've heard, is people taking more traditional events and modifying them for very good reasons. Uh, Ross mentioned, you know, think different. Sounds like you stole that from Apple maybe, but uh, we're all having to, to do that. And for those of you who actually do race events, uh, we do have rules that, that most often are in place for very good reasons uh, that have been you know, modified over the years. And we may be at a point of, of having to look at, at modification those for the time and place we're living in right now. Uh, the, we have a technical commission made up of some of our top officials. We met last week to discuss this, and he needed rules modifications, as well as guidance to our officials community on working with organizers and race directors. I see we have a lot of officials on here uh, as I look through the chat window. Uh, we're going to be sending that communication out very shortly. We spent the weekend going through it. Uh, and rather than go through and just create this whole list of boring results or boring uh, rules modifications, uh, we're taking a little broader approach to it. I'm going to start out just talking uh, about our uh, results and how those get put up. If, if you do a race, you know, traditionally you print out a piece of paper, you take it up, you put it on a wall somewhere on your trailer or on a board and a bunch of people all crowd around it, bumping me in each other to see who got 32nd or 31st in the event. Uh, likewise, there's a protest period of 15 minutes after those posted for folks to uh, go in and say, no, I got 26, not 27 type of thing. Those are there for very good reasons. Uh, it allows folks to be on the same page, literally. Uh, allows the officials, the timing company, and the organizer to look at what may be legitimate mistakes and to change those. Now, as <clears throat> excuse me, as Tara pointed out earlier, we're trying to avoid the uh, people crowding around that board, walking up on the stage. I've been the chief judge several times, and you have that person hovering right over your shoulder 
uh, looking at your results sheet. And we, in this time and, and era, really need to get away from that for safety reasons. So organizers do have the ability to modify that uh, to mitigate risk and create more safe conditions. Uh, as an example, uh, doing electronic posting, I think is the most obvious, whether that's to your Facebook page, whether that's to a website, uh, whether that's via email, uh, and a lot of this relies on the capability to, to have that access on site. Uh, we are moving to allow that, as well as a uh, protest process that differs, and that may be a phone, uh, phone number that you provide that they can call, that may be an email that they need to do immediately. What we want to see with that, and I think the officials, your participants, and you want to see is again consistency. And it got brought up earlier about how important communication is. The method you come up with, it's hugely important that you communicate that to the participants ahead of time, that your officials and timing crew know about it, and that everyone's engaged in what that process is going to look like. Uh, that's something I think everyone can buy into. It may be a longer period. It may be a phone number to call. Someone just put in, uh, in uh, the chat that posts multiple copies around. We have the idea of using a, you know, a big screen TV and just having it scroll results through. There's all kinds of solutions there based on it. And I think this is another great example of uh, people using that forum to share ideas. So feel free to put those on there. But again, this is a, there's a lot of solutions to this. We can't go over every one and people are already sharing them, but having that in place and communicated is really critical. Uh, so we'd ask that you, you look at that. Then we get into, and Sarah, if you want to go to the next slide, uh, we go into, actually, I don't think I have one, sorry. We don't have uh, a list of rules to modify, but I'll give a couple of examples here. In our document, we talk about uh, lengthening race distances to uh, result in less chance of lapping, for instance, in a cyclocross race. That runs afoul of some regulations that we have in place talking about the maximum distance of a time trial course. Again, this is something that probably makes sense for a lot of the year to, or a lot of the, the past years, but it's something that if it results in safer racing, we should look at modifying for this year. There's a couple ways to do that. The first thing, if you're a race organizer and a look at that or another type of rule modifications is to talk to your chief referee, first of all. Uh, small things like going from three and a half to 4K in a cyclocross race, we're gonna empower chief referees to make those decisions uh, be allowed to do. Uh, if there's something major uh, that uh, may come with uh, some ramifications, the chief referee or you can bring it to us and we can issue a derogation from USA Cycling side. And sort of finding that point, uh, I'd rather people err on the side of asking us to, to change that rule. It just protects everybody. So when an athlete comes to you and says, the rule says this, you've got some backup from us to say the other. When these are made, it's critically important that these are communicated again to the participants that all the officials know that everyone's on the same page with these. And uh, I think people can see the common sense in a lot of these and race under them. We have always allowed this to an extent with special regulations for an event. And we're just taking that a little further in this time and era. So if anybody has any questions on this, again, you can use the event services at usacycling.org. And more than ever, it's a great time to talk to the official assign your event or officials and make sure that you're thinking ahead and communicating as much as possible. So Tara, with that, we'll let you uh, take over with any of the questions. Great, thanks Chuck, and thanks everybody for, for, for being on and for our presenters. So Ross, I was wondering if you did have any age demographics. I know you said that you know the 40 year old age group is, is the most popular, but are you seeing declines in the 65 plus age group, which is part of that CDC high risk population? Um, honestly, not of note. I don't have all the numbers right in front of me and I can, I can find that. Maybe if I have something interesting or more definitive, I could put that up in the forum or get it to you. 
Um, but from when we looked at in different age brackets, there was nothing that left out at us and the average age was the same. So I was actually a little surprised. I thought we'd see some more changes there. Yeah, that is pretty interesting actually. Um, and then Ross, you said you got a couple of questions through the chat. Do you wanna address those now? Yeah, I'll, I've got a few here that I thought were interesting that I didn't get to. So thanks people for asking. Um, one was around um, the, the registration curve, basically that you know people registering last minute, are we seeing any difference in the timeline? And um, I'd say it's, it's very similar to the past, but it's a little bit more exaggerated where people are either registering very far in advance for an event that's like a destination style event and they have faith that it might happen several months out um, or we're seeing it really pick up in that final week. Because again, some directors aren't providing like the full list of what the event's gonna look like or if it's gonna happen or not until that final week. So it's that same cross your fingers kind of thing that people are used to dealing with um, just in a different context that I think right now is um, one that makes sense versus just being frustrated with people looking at the weather forecast or something. So again, that transparency, and then that brings me to another question or something that came up that you brought up, Tara, about the possibility of doing like a delayed charge sort of thing. So I just want to touch base on a couple of those things and just say reach out to us to ask more specifics and we can get you set up with the details. But for sure, we've had a couple of people that have asked about this and started to do this where they say, well, I'm not sure if it's going to happen. Can I get everyone to register? provide payment information, but we only charge them if the, if the event's definitely on and um, and we have confidence in that and we can do that. So just reach out to us about how to do that with our waitlist tool. Um, something else came in about, um, about on-site check-in. I thought that was a great diagram you had up there about how this can work. We've seen this work in practice too on both the run and bike side of like pre-stuff those packets, whether you mail them or you just have them set aside so people don't need to grab their own number and be able to come up to you. Um, we also have a check-in tool on Bike Ridge that you can use. So if you want to check people in from a distance, they can just tell you their name or whatever, and you can look them up and note them as checked in if that's all you need. Um, and it will indicate if you need their license status there. We've, um, we've wrapped that into it so you can see if their license is valid just on your screen rather than them walking up with it, things of that nature. A um, couple other tool things that came up. Um, we're talking about starting in fields and waves again reach out to us if you want to know about how to like accommodate that. And I think the final question that I saw was about um, locations that, you know, a lot of, there's been some blanket rulings say in some States, like here in Massachusetts, I think schools have just said, yeah, there's don't count on having any event at a school. It's just off limits for the whole year. So regardless of what our state might say about racing, might have to say about racing being permitted, you might have to get creative with venues. Um, and I don't have any firm recommendations in that except to see what your local ordinances are and maybe look into, um, you know, as long as you're within the context of those rules, maybe you need to look into private property. Um, I know Spartan Race was in the news recently with putting their first big event back on, you know, just a week or two ago in Florida. Um, and I think they caught some flack for um, the bold move of seeing how many people are gonna be there. Um, but one takeaway there was that, you know, they worked with a private property owner. So they had that flexibility to do what they wanted. And from what I was able to read and see on the recap from it, they actually implemented a ton of safety protocols and people were quite pleased with how it went. So again, they just had to get creative in both the location and how they run it. Um, so I think that addresses the questions that I saw, um, but definitely reach out to us if you have more on like working with our tools to do something or anything else I could get in uh, in trends. Just go to Bike Ridge and find the contact us up there. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Ross. Yeah. So, Chuck, I don't have any other questions. Do you have any other that came through your feed? I thought the only one, David, if you're still on, we had a question about how your event this year compared to uh, past editions. If you want to unmute and answer that one. Uh, yeah, actually, um, I, I typed to them, but yeah, we, we were down about 10%. Um, our events aren't huge. Um, I mean, I wish they were, but yeah, we we were down, and it was a beautiful weekend. So I'm I'm a, I'm a contributing that to probably you know coronavirus fears because it was great weather, but but only but only about ten percent so from the previous year, so not bad. Great, great. thanks, Kara. That's uh, that's all I had come through that we haven't uh, answered directly. Great. Well, I will close us out. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to Ross. Thank you, Dr. Rashawn, Chuck. Thank you, David. 
appreciate the time that you guys spent with us today. Um, I will send out a recording of this webinar, the link to the forums. People have already been populating that. So thank you, Alan. Thank you, Adam, for, for posting onto that and sharing resources from your state. And we'll, like I said, we'll continue to have these webinars as the situation changes, as we learn new information. Um, so continue to check back, check out this event resource page for you guys. We have tons of tools on there. We have our risk assessment tool, um, as well as other webinars that we've recorded. So thank you all, and I hope you all have a good day.